This is Rick Liberty with Treaty 10 News, and I'm reporting today on a meeting that we had with the Emergency Operations Center here at the Northwest Community Center. And we were meeting with Northern Medical Health Officers from the Saskatchewan Health Authority and Northern Medical Services. We have Dr. Isaac Sobel, Dr. David Poon, Dr. Veronica McKinney, and Dr. Yudoka Okapawaki. We're joined with uh, Candace Paul, who reports with the NITHA, the Northern Intertribal Health Authority, and myself from the Northwest Incident Command Center on the COVID updates. This is a, an update on the COVID uh, statistics that we can find for data in our region and the latest updates on health issues, uh, as the doctors reported previously, the syphilis and uh, TB spikes that Northern Saskatchewan is having. So here is the conversation we've had with our Northern Medical Health Officers. So Dr. And Sobel, I know uh, we missed you last week, but uh, give us an update and uh, we'll go from there. How's that? Oh, audio, audio. We got their audio. Unmute. There you go. How's that? Awesome. Perfect. Okay, so I have good news and I have uh, questionable news. The good news, uh, last Friday, I was in Saskatoon for the first meeting of the SHA Committee on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, Calls to Action. And one of the members at that uh, meeting was somebody representing the board of CHA, of SHA, I'm sorry, who said that SHA is very interested in making sure that they uh, move ahead on following these um, recommendations for action, which I find extraordinary given the, their history so far. But I was glad to be there. I was the only medical health officer there so I was able to talk about a few issues. Uh, sorry, that's my personal cell. I'll just turn that off. Sorry about that. Um, I, I was I was able to mention, for example, that uh, medical health officers are trained to uh, work with communities uh, to improve the conditions, uh, primary prevention, so looking into socioeconomic determinants of health, and for Indigenous Canadians, that uh, means going all the way back to broken treaties and the Indian Act and residential schools and so on. And, um, you know, that uh, I hadn't seen SHA exhibiting any indication that they wanted uh, medical health officers to be engaged in that part of their work. Uh, because they seem to be happy with us just being communicable disease consultants. And I said, if uh, we could do our work, and hopefully this uh, committee would uh, bring in some recommendations which would allow that to happen, there would be less pressure on the acute care system, which is, of course, what all public health doctors say and what all acute care doctors dismiss as being irrelevant to the system or their lives. So, and uh, they had a couple of uh, patient uh, representatives there, First Nation um, patient family representatives. They had uh, people from all sorts of different executive levels of the SHA. So I think that group might be able to do something positive. So that was really good. It was a productive meeting. And I felt like I was uh, doing well, contributing to it. So I'm doing that in addition to being on the Saskatchewan Medical Association Committee for um, Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion. And I mentioned at all the meetings that although the SHA says that they uh, uh, have communication with representatives from the indigenous communities in Saskatchewan that I have never heard of anyone who is in a leadership position in the far north who's been uh, invited to any of those meetings. And I said that uh, before the SHA came into being, we had a lot of contact because the two health authorities had um, you know, high ranking executives from local communities, local indigenous communities. And now we've lost that completely. And although Dory Gaudet said she wants to reinvent something like that in the far north, as she's the executive director, uh, I haven't seen anything happening um, to that effect. But uh, so I'm a bit hopeful that 
you know, something might change for the better. So that's nice. The negative thing, I just got a call from John Marco Pondo, and I sent uh, David and Veronica an email about this. And he, I was meant to be, uh, I volunteered to be the uh, provincial TBMHO, given the fact that uh, I worked in Nunavut and we had many TB cases. I thought I had a lot of experience and we've got a lot of cases in the far north. Apparently the executive director of whatever group is dealing with the uh, um, TB program called them up and said, tell them, tell Sobel that we want Dr. Ferris to be that MHO, not him. And I asked Dr. Opondo if he knew the reason for that because it didn't make sense to me. And he said, no, they didn't give me a reason. They just said, you're the head of uh, MHO CD and it's not appropriate for the executive director to call this guy directly. So you call on our behalf and tell him that uh, that's the decision that's been made. So, I mean, I spoke at length with Dr. Opondo, and I think he and I have the same view that we don't understand how decisions are being made, that we're not very happy with the way they're made. We don't know what's going on with the SHA. Of course, I told John Mark that uh, this would not be widely circulated, his view, because he's been with the, the province for a, a long time. Uh, but although it didn't make any sense to me, you know, let them know that uh, I will humbly accept uh, uh, their decision, uh, even though it didn't make sense. So there you go. That's uh, so. Those are the uh, some of the updates so far as TB is concerned. We got a new a line list of TB cases in La Lache. There are a lot of them. Of course, we have a lot of TB cases in Sandy Bay as well. And uh, we shall see what's going to go on with this uh, provincial TB program. So far, in the role that I used to have, every meeting that I was invited to had been canceled. So, um, so I, I all I can say is I've signed out of that, um, and I've asked. Um, our executive assistant to delete all the meetings uh, other than AHA TB meetings, which I think I should still be involved in, but just, you know, get rid of everything else. So there you go. And we've had a meeting of the, well, David might want to mention some of this too, because he's been at the meetings I've been at with respect to the MHO only meetings and the, the Monday meetings and the Thursday meetings. So rather than um, you know, just keep blabbering on about everything. Uh, would you be okay if I called upon David to uh, give his input in terms of uh, what's been happening? Uh, thank you, Isaac. And um, I'm sorry about how this was conveyed to you. Um, and I, I am hopeful that we can find a better relationship with the SHA soon. Um, so Rick, um, how it currently works in the province over the past six years was there was a change between a more regional system to the provincial SHA. This in principle was made to give a streamlined approach. The challenge is uh, the particular needs of the North are different than the needs of the rest of the province, which left us in a challenging position where we were being held uh, to specific SHA policies, provincial policies that may not work well in the north. So most recently, this has come up with how we are hoping to approach school absenteeism during the fall. So the SHA has a, and pardon me, the ministry, the province has a particular form that they want sent out and, and to the different schools, ah, if you have this many people not showing up, you, you better, better get something fixed. Um, and Isaac and I felt it wasn't quite the right fit for the northern people, you know, we, uh, Isaac has a, a good calling texting relationship with the um, uh, the school district here. And in particular, uh, the province wanted a specific percentage of people who aren't showing up to flag a concern that an outbreak was occurring. So uh, the number informally has been 30%. And so where, where Isaac and I felt that uh, the north needs its own specific way is for various reasons, uh, people showing up to school here in the north may be at lower numbers than than typical or or higher for some reasons, uh, but it would be different than the rest of the province. That's the whole point. And you cannot just blanketly say, if they're 30% not showing up, it's, it's definitely due to COVID. And uh, 
because the province had wanted something standard, uh, we felt that that wouldn't necessarily be appropriate for the North. So that's just an example of where Isaac and I uh, are hoping to work with the SHA in a di different way. And thanks to the support of NMS uh, and the team, uh, Veronica in particular, we're hoping to navigate that. But these are the these are the basic ideas of what's so important for us. Uh, we know the North is a particular way, and we want to make sure that we advocate and make sure that the North is treated in a way that makes sense for the North. Um, this if, school if example I, is just can, one of many. If I yes. can butt in for a second. Yeah, you mm -hmm. know, uh, we've established a great relationship with the uh, director of the Northern Lights School District. I know we've got three school districts in our, in our region. Uh, the other two are somewhat small, but um, you know, I can just get on the phone at any time and speak with Jason Young, and David and I were on the phone with him and uh, told him what the province uh, was proposing, and we thought it wasn't uh, reasonable, and he said, yeah, he said, uh, we have high levels of uh, non-attendance, and he said, we've worked out our own system, and let's just stick with that system. The principal uh, involved will let the uh, regional director know, and they'll let me know, and then I'll let you know if we think something's happening. So a much more uh, efficient way of dealing with that. And uh, it fits with the way that we interact with these other entities, which is much more personal than it most likely is in the South. So uh, just amplifying what, what David said. and. Um, you know, that, that the same scenario happened during COVID and we complained about that. And I think in this instance, we're just going to have to say, uh, we're not going to do what the, what SHA says has to be done. It doesn't make sense, but that's a battle that I think is going to be continuing. Um, so, um, if you know, Rick, that a lot of people are not going to school because of COVID, let me know. Candace, you too. No, I think that's the perfect uh, communication link that you've created. And sure. from the community point of view, that's that's the inter, you know, the I guess security blanket. You're 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 the ones we need to hear from directly. Sure. And that's why we reached out and how this venue came out to be. But uh, Veronica, you had your hand up, so. Uh, I was just going to let uh, let both David and Isaac know, I don't know if you guys even know, but even the semester system in some of our high schools is different. Like we have three semesters, not two semesters, and that's to account for things like in the fall that, you know, there's hunting season and stuff. So sometimes, and it's also to allow the students to graduate or complete more classes so that if they do don't if they do drop out for a time that it's less classes that they have to do so the whole system has been modified to account for that so in Laloche they do this for sure and I know in the far north they do this as well so you know the reality is that even the system itself is actually markedly different than what it is down south and this is to accommodate different realities of of our communities um, not to mention the the numbers of students that we have in terms of volumes and things like that like age range for our communities and such so anyways i just thought i'd throw that in just so that you were aware there's some actual quite marked differences even in how uh, the school is is broken up into different semesters and things like that and why it's done that way see the other uh, aspect to that like even sandy bay is an example it's a dual jurisdictional community. It's got First Nations and it's in the middle of the TLE. So, you know, maybe that's a, a highlight for you, uh, uh, Udoka, is take a look at the, the treaty land entitlement. And what there was was a schedule for each community that was involved. And Deschambeau went fully First Nations, transferred to school, health, everything was transferred to the First Nations. Sandy Bay wasn't. And Sandy Bay is on schedule to do that. But in terms of transfer payments between federal and provincial government, the health transfer, the education transfer, the infrastructure transfer, all that is at treasury board level. So the treaty land entitlement is an agreement between the provincial government and the federal government, not with the bands. It's a transfer payment agreement. And if you look at that, you'll see the missing pieces that Sandy Bay is having. It's missing out on a lot of services. 
It's partly service for provincial high, uh, provincial schools, provincial housing, and then on reserve services as well. But it does impact the community. It does like, you know, if you look at these statistics and you look at them all equally, does it show Sandy Bay doesn't even have a grocery store? Look at the nutrition level of Sandy Bay. Now look at Melfort. If you want to compare us to Kindersley, De, you know, Debden, if you want to standardize all these communities, it, it doesn't fare. Then the other part is rural municipalities. We have trappers up north. We have trappers, traditional land users, fishermen that go out on the land, risk their their life, you know, their lives being on the land, uh, you know, surviving on the land. But in the south, you have farmers. Farmers are doubly supported. You have Canwood municipality and health system. Then outside that is a rural municipality that has everything from infrastructure. You got, you know, natural gas, power. So the developmental north, so if you want these, these are points of argument you can use when you face people. The north is different. It's un it's unorganized properly yet. And provincially, you know, the South wanted to farm itself. That was the Assiniboine promise between Alberta and Saskatchewan, if you look at our history. The North was part of Northwest Territories, and we wanted to govern ourselves and build capacity within ourselves. So the health authorities that we were afforded, the school boards we were afforded, the municipalities that came to us were just like capacity building. We're, we're going to step up and eventually govern ourselves. This province and this latest party has dismantled all of this. It has taken everything that was indigenous for us, like the NORTEP, NORPAC program, the professional access college. People could go to university directly from your home. They stopped it. Now they're ma making little regional promises. Pine House gets this. Cumberland House gets this. LaRange gets this. Laloche gets this. It's all piecemeal. And we used to have a surface lease agreement for all our mines in the north. And there was an, an agreement that we would fly our workers one week in, one week out without disrupting as much from our families. Because the uranium mines wanted to make more money with, by saving flights, went to two weeks in, two weeks out. Now imagine a family member that is raising and nurturing families has to be absent for two weeks. So you, it affects attendance. To, we know it affects our schools, but you can't measure that in Saskatoon or Regina. It's affecting our small communities big time, like our, our minor sports program. These are the coaches we're supposed to have in our communities, coaching our, our families and our, and our students. No, they're up in the mines, playing volleyball, whatever, after work, but not in their communities helping for the benefit of our community. So the North is unique in many ways, but the challenges... You can't compare us to a you know centralization policy. This it won't work. It uh, will resist it, I guess. You know, once we once we figure out our jurisdictional dance between our First Nations and Métis, I think if we can all jig together, that's when uh, things will happen. So that's why we keep hoping that leadership will will follow through and the citizens will follow through. But I I thank you for your advocation. I I. I just love it when people go to bat for us and, and Dr. Sobel and Dr. Poon. I can't say enough thanks for, you know, the, for that. But with the leadership of Dr. McKinney, Dr. McKinney has hit the nail on the head every time. So it's, uh, <laughs> you know, when she goes on national news and reports about our Northern situation, it's, it's, it's been bang on. So mm -hmm. but I'll thank Candace for joining us, but I, I don't want to, I'll get off my little soapbox here. And I'll uh, give it to Dr. McKinney, but I, I thank you for your northern advocacy. Yeah, well, I will. If, well, if I could just if I could just add one more thing before Dr. McKinney takes it over, uh, I, I forgot about another piece of good news during our weekly uh, call last week with uh, our nurses. Apparently, the uh, the clinics for flu shots and COVID shots, at least uh, last I heard, were going really well. The nurses' clinics were uh, being well attended. People were calling up ahead of time saying, I want my shot. So let's hope that this year we have a much better percentage of people who are covered both for 
the new COVID vaccine and their flu vaccine. So sorry to interrupt, Veronica, but I that was another piece of news I thought was important that I forgot. That's good news. Mm -hmm. Now that is good news for sure. So um, a couple of things, I'll start off with the COVID report and then I've got some things I'll follow up with you on there too. Um, one is right now, like the emergency rooms are filling up. So we know COVID has been increasing um, and it's across Canada. Right now in Canada, one in 21 people are infected here in Saskatchewan. It's one in 16 people, very, very high. Um, yesterday we had 100 and I think it was 112 people that were waiting for beds. Today, this morning, it's down to 91 that are um, waiting for beds in the emergency departments. But really, again, what that means is that there's hardly any beds open to actually see patients with. And when, when we're talking about sending our patients down, that's a real problem. We know Isle, for instance, has had a real problem keeping open and keeping capacity. So they, one of the things the SHA wants to do by regionalized, they're not regional, but um, keeping it more provincial is repatriate people or send them out to other places, wherever the beds are, regardless of where the patient is from. And they haven't been able to send anybody to Isle or even to Lalosh recently, which is probably good <laughs> because we don't have enough staff anyways, but we don't have staff. Um, it's stupid things like hiring all these, um, uh, what do they call them again? The nurses that are from certain, um, that they're, they're contract nurses, I guess they're called. So they're from certain organizations, um, but they don't like things like not even stalking at night. So sometimes the doctors are like having a heck of a time because they might have had a resuscitation a few days ago and then they go back for another resuscitation. There's things not there. They're talking about before they start their shift, they're going and grabbing syringes and stuff to make sure that they've got what they need in the rooms. Like we're talking, this is getting crazy, 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 crazy with how little we have. Um, in my mind anyways. And right now in Canada, they're looking at about 1,100 excess deaths per week. So we know that with COVID, as the numbers actually start to climb up, we'll start to see more of the hospitalizations and we're going to see more of these excess deaths. So it's not gone anywhere. I'm glad to hear that the shots are, are being taken up and I certainly have been promoting that. Um, I've been asking our doctors to promote that. Uh, we are seeing a little bit more masking, I think, in the in the clinic. Some of the doctors are wearing their masks all the time. I have not stopped. I wear an N95 all the time and uh, in the clinic and, and, you know, anytime I'm indoors. So it's, um, I think it's still good, good uh, practice to do that. What they are saying uh, in Saskatchewan is that the infections are about right now, they're, they're severe, they're 20 times higher than what they've been at the lowest point during the pandemic. Long COVID estimate is about 19.1 times higher. Uh, hospitalization in the ICU, 12.4 times higher and deaths are 25 times higher. So what can you do? Get your vaccines, wear N95 or any, you know, with the best mask you can get your hand on. Uh, avoid indoor social gatherings if you can, and avoid crowded non-essential places if you can. Um, people who are 60 and older or babies that, in what, that are less than a year or pregnant people are at higher risk. Um, all ages of immunocompromised or medically at-risk people or people who have had no vaccines or infections in the last three months would be at higher risk as well. Uh, in terms of um, we we seem to have a fair enough, like I was very disappointed to hear about that, that TB situation, Isaac, because certainly we know in the north we have 90 times the rate of TB compared to anywhere else. And that doesn't include PA. I, I forget if is Dr. Fairness from PA area or where is he practicing? He's the PA MOH, but he's from Montreal. Well, well yeah. He, Sorry. And, yeah. And, and he's practicing there uh, because there's still uh, no word whether Dr. Chokandi is coming back. And if Dr. Chokandi comes back, then Dr. Nasungu, I think, is going to say that position should be based in Meadow Lake to help him out. That was what the original funding was for. Yes. Yeah, that's what I thought. So, I mean, the reality is it's very disturbing to me. And, and of course, 
what we see in other places in Canada is not the same as what we're seeing in our north. We see primary TB, not the secondary TB. In a lot of other places, they do tend to see more secondary. It tends to be with the higher uh, immigrant populations, those types of things. So very different. And, and that bothers me. The other thing that worries me is we did do studies um, out of the north. We saw it most predominantly in, in the Athabasca region. But post COVID, we've actually had pediatric deaths because the rates of TB have gone up significantly post COVID. And this seems to be related to the, the um, decreased function of the T cells when, when you're post COVID. So, you know, like I said, and we do know there's a lot of, uh, of um, things that are affected by this virus. We still probably are likely to see more um, I was reminded that things like HIV, for instance, you don't necessarily see AIDS until seven to eight years after the initial infection, sometimes or even, sometimes even longer. Um, things like panencephalitis with measles doesn't necessarily show up right away. That can be quite some time down the road. Even with, uh, with streptococcal infections and rheumatic fever, you may not see the um, valvular heart disease till sometime down the road. So, you know, there are a number of viruses and bacteria for that matter that can cause effects that are down the road. Certainly, I think we're already seeing that there's a lot of problems with, with COVID. Um, in terms of um, the, the frustration right now, I, I you know, I, I'm glad that the SMA, I think it was the SMA that you said, have um, a committee to address TRC calls to action. I think it was SMA, was it SMA or SHA? Yeah, that's SHA. So I, I mean, I, and it's good, but it's very dismissive to me that really they're only bringing in a few patient advocates who are Indigenous. There are a number of Indigenous providers, whether that's physicians, nurses, we have pharmacists, we have a lot of different people in the system now. It is extremely disturbing to me that we are not making use of those individuals. Um, the other thing that I find disturbing is that the um, SHA has a First Nations and Métis department, which has not been very functional, I'll be perfectly plain and honest, but not very functional at all right from its inception. Um, it's my understanding that their director is off on medical leave currently. There's a lot of dysfunction there, and they seem to rely on these community advisors, they call them. They have a very select group of elders and a very select group of community advisors, which I have a problem with because it sort of indicates that a very few people will be representative of all the indigenous people across Saskatchewan. We have 74 nations. Um, there's no inclusion of, of groups like FSIN or the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan. And, and you cannot expect that one elder from one community is going to be representative of all communities. That in and of itself, that concept of pan-indigeneity is racist. So that would be my first comment. <laughs> if I'm a bit frustrated with the whole thing, don't uh, don't take it personally. I, I mean, it's great that they're talking about these things, but even the, the way they're approaching it is insulting, inappropriate, and racist. So um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> the other, I'm, I'm also glad that they are um, looking at EDI, but my concern there is that they sort of are dealing with this much more like in a marginalized way when in fact a lot of the communities or people that they're talking about when they talk about equity diversity and inclusion it's a very um again colonial kind of way of looking at things um i i really feel that a lot of times rather than looking at the strengths or the things that are going on in these various communities um it's it's sort of that picture again of the great white savior coming in to save all these groups SHA doesn't know their head from their butt in any of these things, and we all know it. So, like, honestly, for them to sort of take the charge or the lead seems quite, again, a systemic way of approaching things that has been non-functional. So I, I know I'm really talking to the converted here, but I, I find it extremely frustrating that despite all of this, they continue down these roads without any inclusion of communities or groups 
or people that are, e are even already embedded within their own systems who have good knowledge. And I, I feel like you're a good representative, Dr. Sobel, I'm not suggesting otherwise, but given that they have so much more at their hands and their opportunity to do things, this is again, a very uh, good example of how little they're willing to look at things and really approach things in the way that they need to be done. And I'm not talking just indigenous populations, I'm talking all of our different populations that we have right now, because they just really don't seem to be willing to, to work with anybody. And I'm frustrated with the TB part again, because you guys are the MHOs, not only for some of these SHA sides, but Athabasca as well. There's no inclusion of our First Nations communities or the organizations that work within our First Nations communities. Um, this idea that they seem to think that they are, they use our numbers a lot, but they sure as heck don't address anything. And this magical template that's gonna cover everybody is clearly not at all appropriate for the North. I know that SHA has been in existence for six years. Um, they've only just started tackling the population health, but they left us in limbo for a good four to three to four years before they, 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 they have even started to recognize um, that maybe they do need to, to include community. And I think they're only giving us lip service, to be perfectly honest. This was brought up multiple times long before it got switched over. Um, we actually had meetings with SHA. There was a think tank group out of PA that we brought together. Everybody keeps saying, yep, you need community involvement. That's the definition of community health. <laughs> like we are now talking an oxymoron here. So I, I feel like you, Rick, I'm sorry, you've got my blood boiling here again. And I'm just like, <laughs> very frustrated. Um, so anyways, that's where things are at. Uh, we are just starting up with this um, uh, uh, First Nations Health Ombudsperson's Office. And there too, I'm trying to really direct. Uh, there's not a lot of medical people in there, but one of, some of the things that I think we need to be assessing is not just the individual problem and trying to resolve that issue, we need to be looking at the systems. And we already know that some of these systems for the North, this is a prime example, it, it's not functional. It is not at all functional for our communities. It is isolating our communities even more than what they should. I really appreciated that background that you gave us, Rick, in terms of you know, that idea that we would have our own governance because I actually, I, I still believe that we need to go for that direction. I really don't believe this is going to be functional for the North whatsoever. Every time I turn around, it seems like the same thing is occurring over and over again with very little, well, I, I would say no inclusion of, of our indigenous population whatsoever. It's other people making decisions. And um, we do know part of the problem I'll be frank with the SHA is that it is not even the leadership that are making the decisions. It is coming directly from the government, from the S from the SAS party. And frankly, the individual ministers or, or people that are working in those departments don't have an idea about any of this stuff. Um, and so they're just doing it based on what they think are political decisions, but I don't even know that that's, I, I, I don't even know I could say that to be honest. So, We'll have to see what's going on. The other thing that I'm encouraging us to do is to look at when these cases come in through the First Nations Health is that we look at the levels of harm. There was, a, there's been, a, a, it's called Sanya's levels of harm. And that's out of BC where they look at, okay, well, what harm is being done here? And I think there is a lot of harm being done. And I think we do need to go back to the treaty rights because our treaty rights don't only talk about Western, uh, you know, access to the medicine chest, ACA, the Western form of medicine, but it's also to our traditional medicines, which is far more robust and inclusive. It's not just medicine per se, it's the ability to go to our land, to be able to gather as groups, as people, to live on the land, to be able to, to do things according to our season. And I we talk about, you know, these are our relatives, the trees, the sun, the moon, you know, this is our relatives. All the things that are affecting them is quite horrendous and it affects our health, clearly. Things like climate impact, things like, you know, the animal population, not having a place to go anymore. And, and you know, all these diseases, they all affect us for sure. And this is what we're talking about when we're talking about community health. Um, I am disturbed by videos I've seen recently out of Pelican where, They've always had gangs there, but there's more gang involvement now from the south. 
and the uh, initiation for young kids is to kill another gang, a different gang, an opposite gang member. So there's young kids walking around all times of day and night with machetes and guns, and you're hearing gunshots all the time. They have a nursing station there, and they're seeing numbers of gunshot wounds all the time. There's no lab. Flin Flon is the closest hospital, but they don't have a lot there either, and they've certainly cut off a lot of the services. So when you were talking about Sandy Bay and this difficulty and that whole Northeast corridor is really without much in the way of services. We've actually put doctors in there 24-7. Uh, we have two on the ground at any one time and they go directly to Sandy Bay twice a week and to DeChambault twice a week rather than having people fly in from, from PA. What we discovered is that the money they were spending on travel, we could pay for those extra doctors and we could pay for them to be there. We actually only have funding for four doctor days a week in Pelican. This whole North Corridor, Northeast Corridor, is around 6,000 people. And if you look for comparability over in, in Isle of Cross, which is a, a little bit less in terms of the size that it's covering, we have six full-time equivalents physicians working there. But we really, given all the stuff, they, they uh, the time off and stuff that they need, we actually require eight and a half to nine doctors to cover that whole area. So think about it four doctors, which means two on the ground at any one time, compared to, you know, nine, and I realize there's probably about five or six on the ground at any one time out of aisle. But I mean, this is, this is not equitability whatsoever. When you look at the far north, and we are about three quarters the size of the Yukon, we're about the same population. I believe they have something like 25 physicians per uh, 1000 patients. We only have around, I think it's about, what is it now? We've got um, about 35 doctors serving 40,000 people. So a much less number compared to, to, to any other Northern communities. Um, you know, so that's, that's a big problem. The other thing that I've just uh, been informed about is that um, the airstrip or the airport in La Ronge is primarily funded through the town of La Ronge itself. And so, the town isn't feeling like they can continue on with that and we think about how much traffic comes out of that airport for medical reasons whether that's air ambulance whether that's going out to outlying communities things like that but I'm thinking economically like how many of those planes go through to the mines and things um, that you know it's I know it's one of the busiest airports in Saskatchewan I think maybe even the third busiest so it it's it's quite high um, so again, now we're trying to write advocacy letters to try to get some funding for, for that, both, um, you know, if we can get it provincially, federally, we need to look at that for sure. So there's a lot going on for sure in a lot of our communities. Um, the other thing I was going to mention was the Jordan's principle. Um, there is increased funding for people. It seems around housing and such, and it's more for the kids, but that can be accessed through social work or, um, uh, through housing authorities. So I know in some of the communities, they have their own housing. And if somebody's going to be evicted, because sometimes with all the increased costs, like the rent has gone up, the cost of food has gone up, and people are having to make a choice, like, do I pay for food this month or do I pay for the rent? So um, there can be some ability to access funding through Jordan's principal. It is not through the doctors. We saw people trying to come in and get uh, doctors to fill out some of these uh, write a letter on their behalf. It's not ongoing funding, but it can help you to stave things off until social services can increase your your budget so that you, you can actually manage. But I mean, these are the real boots and hitting the ground kind of things that are going on. And and we've got a lot going on in our communities and, and people are really, really struggling right now. I worry about the cold coming because we have a great number of homeless people. And we do know that a lot of the people uh, we just don't have enough housing. We just don't have enough places and we don't have enough support for what they call complex care. Um, here in Saskatoon, where, you know, Saskatoon Tribal Council tried to help where they could, they are now recognizing they don't have the, the ability to look after some of these complex care people. And I would say the same thing holds in our communities and we have no place to put them. And so these people are at risk. Um, you know, I look at how much we try to do in terms of, uh, like even things like opioid reduction, having what we call the OATS program, opioid replacement therapy. We don't have enough people to be able to, to manage all of these different pieces. So 
there is a lot of work that needs to happen and a lot of advocacy for our north but on the, on the last note as you all know the um the the population that we serve is the complete polar opposite of the rest of the population like in numbers wise we have much younger population we are a pyramid where we've got way more younger people than we do elderly people our numbers in terms of things like traumas in terms of mental health in terms of infectious diseases all massively higher i think i was telling you last week our syphilis rates have increased in the north over three thousand percent we I'm, I'm always fearful. We have a lot more hep C and HIV than we even know about because I see a lot of the people down south here, but somehow they're not identified up north. There's not a lot of talk with specialists coming in. We're likely to lose the current psychiatrist we have, the only one we have that's coming to the north um, because her partner has trained as a neurosurgeon and the SHA will not hire her even though there's a need for the, a neurosurgeon. So that forethought of the SHA in, in hiring people and seeing what we need and working with community, not happening. And I am very frustrated by all of this. And I really don't see a way forward with them because they're not willing to really talk at the table. The fact that they would hold a committee um, and it's really only people from the SHA other than yourself, Dr. Sobel, it sounds like, rather than really going far beyond is telling and this is the problem i've had with them is that it's very incestuous it's very much the people they want to work with and and they bring in you know my my other frustration is that they often bring in our doc like doctors from different places and this might sound a bit weird coming from me but doctors don't represent the communities <laughs> unless you've lived and grown up there for your whole life and you're part of that community you cannot represent those communities so much as as we do i think some good work we cannot necessarily represent our communities. We need to have our community people there front and center. And we do have a number of trained individuals who are from those communities that could speak to these issues in, in a very meaningful way that I, I know would be very helpful. But anyways, that's my soapbox for the day and I'm gonna shut up now. <laughs> uh, if I can, uh, 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 Veronica, I, I, I certainly understand uh, your, sense about that and at, at the EDI meeting and at the uh, calls to action meeting I mentioned that uh, you know uh, public health doctors MHOs are meant to be working on primary prevention and with respect to the truth and reconciliation calls for action uh, as you talk about you know a racist or colonial approach you know there should be a partnership with uh, representatives of First Nations and Métis communities at the very beginning of developing a, a, a program or a proposal or, or any change in the way things are operating, and they do not do that. And um, so I make a point of that every meeting that they are, you know, they're always violating the calls to action. And uh, that's a significant uh omission in the way that they're they're acting and i don't know if this falls on dead ears i've been saying it over and over i haven't seen anything change i'm very skeptical uh veronica as you said uh about you know what all these committees are going to do uh, i don't know if there's uh, uh they're just trying to placate people by pretending to do something um I try to be hopeful, but you know, day after day, it seems like same old, same old. So, uh, and I agree with you. I think that uh, the way around it is to figure out some uh, way of having son of Neetha or something like that, or or Neetha plus, or uh, instead of Neetha, some way that we could be masters of our own destiny. Uh, I say we, I mean the communities, not me, um, in order to have a health system which actually responds to community needs no that's uh i always saw once once the centralization of sha i knew why they were doing it politically but the nitha model of us coming together i think you're that's the multi-jurisdictional solution i think we got to do it together i think a, a northern nitha with the metis and uh and, and the whole nad district that's 
that's who we need to focus on. And, you know, that's Treaty 10, like I said, Treaty 10, Treaty 8, and Treaty 6 adhesion. And Treaty 5, Cumberland House has always been that, uh, you know, they're on the Saskatchewan River Delta, but they're, you know, they're, we've always included them in the Northern Dialogue. And I, I think that's, this province has fooled around with those jurisdictions and, and service delivery of those jurisdictions. It's, it's impacting us. And, the, you know, so it's corporately, uh, we see where SHA is going and also, uh, you know, the privatization. It's, to me, with the heartless move they're making, these are lobbyists that are working on their behalf. I believe lobbyists drive those policies, but the, the heart of the community is, is critical. And I think it's, it, you know, for health rise, we don't want to miss the heart. <laughs> I think that the model, you know, someday we're not there. We're we're trying to perfect the system that's that needs tinkering and, and you know it needs open mindedness. And uh, I'm glad all the participants here have have kept that mind open. So it's uh, I like it. It's uh, there's hope, but it's not there. We're not there yet. It's a frustrating long road to hoe, especially when you want to care and nurture. Uh, Dr. Poon, you said you were leaving in about five minutes. Uh, you want to? Uh, yes, uh, Isaac and I have a meeting uh, in about three minutes or so. Um, but there's a lot here to learn. I'm really grateful for these Wednesday afternoon sessions. Uh, I've been asking people to please contact me so I can send them your way, Rick. Uh, and I just uh, I'll be be forwarding you an email from some community members who wanted to join. But this type of dialogue is so meaningful. Uh, I'll be here uh, in LaRange next week, and then as well for the week of November the 12th for an industry meeting, and I'm hoping uh, to continue to have these these uh, contacts. It means a lot. Lots to say, but for our next meeting. Okay, I'm going to jump over to Candice now. I know, uh, Candice, I, you might have been busy with the election. I just gave you a, an apology on that behalf, but go ahead if there's any questions you may have before you leave. That, that wasn't quite it. It was trying to plant garlic in frozen ground. <laughs> from monday to wednesday the ground changed <laughs> um anyway no we are in the middle of an election and uh we won't know until tonight who's going to be who we'll be working with i i have one hopeful chief <laughs> the rest i don't know but you know that would that one I I would definitely would be involved in these meetings. That one has complete interest. So I'm really hoping. But uh, other than that, um, hearing your frustration, oh my lord. Oh, I don't I don't envy your positions really. Um, I mean, it's frustrating enough living in it. <laughs> We're kind of just, you know, try to stay as healthy as possible so we don't have to use the system. But we are seeing a lot of COVID in Patchenac right now. Um, at one point, nine staff members in the school were out. Uh, we're seeing people starting to present now since then with more long-term effects. I don't know if they'll grow out of them or not. So uh, it is there. They are doing... I don't know what the turnout's been for the immunization clinics, but they are doing them. And uh, yeah, the whole thing with the mining, Rick, you know, like I've got people who would be valuable to our, our emergency management teams in the summer months and so forth. They're not around because of their work. And, you know, we do need a more sustainable local economy than, than just the mines so that people have other options. But uh, we would like to see improvements in services. I've got elders who haven't had their toenails cut probably for a year uh, in my community because they can't access the services from uh, SHA. And we don't have a trained home care worker who can do those things, you know? So these are, these are real concerns. It's, in, it's affecting quality of life and uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that because I know you guys got to go. See you in a week. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we lost two of our partners. I think 
Dr. Sobel may, may be leaving us, but uh, <clears throat> Dr. McKinney and Dr. Yudoka, uh, I guess, the, the, like we said, the COVID is present in our communities. We can feel it. Uh, we hear about it from, from coworkers and, uh, and to our blessing here, I guess, you know, the first person that kind of got it was Clarence Iron and Clarence has a, you know, a listener base. So what I, I'll be making this report on Missinippi broadcasting tomorrow. I have a, an interview with uh, Abel Charles. So I'll try and reiterate, you know, the frustrations and, and the potential that we have for a better health care. You know, that's, we have to create it. I think that's, yeah. you know, that's the heart. It's our responsibility. So we can't just shy away from it. We do have rights to, to hang our hats on, but uh, the responsibility of designing and creating is, uh, is born on us, I guess. It's in, in, you know, otherwise somebody will fumble it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, there's such little available right now too. And a lot of people are thinking, well, I've got a cold or I've got the flu, but you know, there's actually not elevated risk uh, numbers of flu right now. And a lot of people don't have the, the testing to do at home. And even if they do, it's not showing up as positive till about four or five days after they've already got symptoms. And sometimes not at all. So, it, you know, sometimes they think they don't have it, but they really do. But this one has been bad. And we know those long haul effects can be pretty bad. I mean, a lot of people with wheezing now and stuff too with, with it. So like, I mean, there's a lot of things going on, not to mention the blood clots, you know, we're seeing strokes and heart problems. And there's just a lot of different things going on. And, and Candace, you kind of missed, but I, I was saying when you look at other viruses, they're, what they think is that there's this pool that's kept in our body and they think it's actually kept in our GI tract. And this isn't uncommon, but sometimes you're not going to see some of those effects till, till several, several years or quite a ways down the road. But the stuff that we know, and it does definitely increase the, the uh, dementia for sure. They are seeing some signs of panencephalitis in some kids, not, not everybody. So some of the symptoms for that are pretty subtle. Like you might just notice a kid that's kind of not doing as good in school. They're, you know, a little bit more irritable than usual. I mean, these are pretty minor things. Sometimes you think, gee, is it hormones in the teenager years? Like what's going on? But yeah, so it's, um, it, it definitely has long haul effects. And my worry is for the youth, to be honest, but also for our elders, because we, we don't want to lose the people with the knowledge. Like, you know, this is, something we really have to treasure and try to make sure that we're seeing. And I, you know, I was talking to our doctors and even just in terms of having some of the information that we used to have in terms of epidemiology, like how many people are being seen, what's going on. We don't have any of that. And that's true for not just COVID, but for a lot of things. One of the things the doctors were asking about was, well, how many people are getting pap tests? Like how many women are actually getting that? How many do they really go on to need other things? Like, we used to have a lot more robust information in that way. And, and so we, we probably need more. I know that's part of what, uh, uh, you know, Duoco, you're looking at with Simpson. Some of that will be covered with that, but you know, like it, it's crazy that we can't even get basic information that we should be able to pull out of these EMR systems, but we just aren't able to. So it, it's, it's like I said, it's getting very ridiculous. I think like we're not providing just a basic standard of care even. Yeah, the, I guess uh, we need professional <laughs> we need professional help to design something. But I need the uh, you know uh, you're on the right track with that engineering thought as well as regional planning and uh, yeah. and the whole aspect of I guess community and you know the whole service program delivery of it's just this jurisdictional mango yeah. you know if we can line it up maybe yeah. we, can, we can design something but uh i think that's what's missing in the north i believe is the dream you know you know people to to see a blueprint or to see a an artist's rendering or an architect's rendering of of what should happen not only of a building but you know a regional development of you know what your yeah. health needs are what your school needs are where your recreational and and environmental protective, you know, you talk about medicines and that. I see the logging here. There's just like drunken loggers out there. They're they're going right to the yeah. lakes and rivers and uh, 
Uh, it's just no regard. It's very industrial driven. And that's where you see this province hung its head on. And, uh, you, you know, because... The sad the, thing is, Rick, nobody's doing anything. That's the hurting part. Yeah. Like we... Everybody seems to be pretty defeated. Yeah. Yeah. We heard uh, Rodney when we were talking to Rodney about the logging thing. And he, he's ready it up in arms as well. But it's just, they're not going to do it alone. You know, they need... <laughs> You need, uh, I guess. Well, it, it, I think it's a, a view that even when you do do it within the confines of law, <laughs> you know, you can be demonized and it, they'll just ignore you and push you off, court injunction you out. And that that isn't, you know, there's a futility to that effort. So what's going to work? Well, I might have to get on my soapbox. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we something. I agree with you, Candace. We live, we live in a democracy, so. <laughs> well, supposedly. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, even at the English River uh, elections, uh, you know, on, on my side, I'm hopeful for an education uh, facility in our region, you know, co opting with our community here in the, the Metis side and also the English River side, I think. The potential for a you know post secondary or cultural education system is 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 here. We just got to design it. We're in the Treaty Ten area. There's no there's no university in Treaty Ten. There's no you know it's yeah. the dream is there. It's just yeah. we just got to get the stars to align. If you know now yeah. we have more cannabis stores than Tim Hortons. Who would have thunk that ten years ago? Right? Yeah. It's, uh, it's it's quite the change in our you know, the social media world, I'm watching the news today and there's a robot doing a, a, a scan of a patient. You know, it's this is a Saskatchewan in, Institute of Indigenous uh, Technologies there. Uh, they're looking at health technologies, what they could do. So here's a robot looking at a, a person in remote, you know, from a remote location. So that's our stuff we've got in there. That's SIIT. Like we've been working with them. They're part of our hub. Yeah. And that arm that they're using, that's the remote ultrasounds that we've already been doing in Lalosh, Stony, and uh, Pelican. We've been doing that. We were helping to get that going. But that's who I think, uh, like I said, I really want to get some, some certificate programs going so that we can train our youth, our young people, our people, or it doesn't have to be young people, but our people from the communities so that they can be working with us on that technology because there's a lot coming. And then if we could ladder that into things like being a combined lab tech or, or whatever, if that's where people want to go, they may just want to stick with what they've got. But that's the people that will stay in the community. It's not going to be people that, you know, are flown in and coming out. And that's where our shortages are coming from. It, it's quite interesting. I was just over at SIIT not very long ago, but the technologies they have are impressive. And, and I think they're very much on board with a lot of this. The hub that is going to that is being built, it's going to be over at Whitecap. That should come about. That building will be present by 2025. But we've got a lot of those pieces. And um, myself and Dr. Mendez just presented um, to the uh, Canadian Indigenous uh, Technology Network uh, just last week, I think it was, and that was over at Whitecap as well. So, so we are doing a lot in the north, and that's why I'm saying we are leading the pack in the world with what we're doing in the north and yet probably you guys don't even know about it but we should be replicating this big time to a lot of different areas and making this work because and it's the communities it's our northern communities that have always been innovative and willing and doing all these things that's why it's happening there so we should be be magnifying that quite substantially so all those things you saw that's already going on up north and we're working with them to keep it up and we want to you know, do more communities for sure. Well, that's what, uh, when we were sharing that news story with you uh, about a month back was the Northern Ontario doctor training program. Yeah. They're, they're right in the community. They're not, they're not yeah. in the university setting. They're right in the community. So yeah. that's the way NORPAC was designed was, you know, the entry level should be at the community level yeah. and then you develop from there. So it's uh, modeling, you know, we're creating yeah. that model is, we need to do that interjurisdictionally. It can't be just on First Nations. I think 
Yeah. The North has to unite on itself. Our, we, our population yeah. is so small, you know, that we have yeah. to combine it to, to make it well, make an impact. And we already have out of Isle, there are residents, so people trained to be family doctors, they're already MDs, and they spend four months in Isle. And they'll go to the different communities. And in La Ronge, we advocated for a residency program so they can do their whole training out of La Ronge. But my problem is, again, these are non-Indigenous people leading these. We need our community involved with that because it needs to be the community that is leading some of these people. And we've got Indigenous people that are training right now. So those are the ones we should hang on to and try to get get into our communities as much as possible. So I think there's much more we could do. So there's some stuff going on that we could work together on for sure that I think would be really helpful. Do you know we've graduated over a hundred Indigenous uh, students already out of medicine and yet we don't see them very often. We've got a few in Northern Medical Services, but, uh, and if you look, Dr. John Starr, for instance, will be working out of aisle in the next little bit, just you know, as a fill-in, but he's working in a few different places. But he's worked with us for years, and he's First Nations um, out of Starblank, first Star Blanket First Nation, I believe. So, uh -oh. yeah. So we've got people, and Dr. Amber Gruno is Métis. She works out of Alacross. She's been there for a little while now too. So we we have some Indigenous people, and we need to increase that. But we need to get that community connection now. Is my my feeling. So that community can guide us as to where they want to go and what they think we should be doing. I don't believe it should be the doctors leading things. I, you know, they they should be led by community and then advocating for for these changes. Yeah. Doctor Yudoka, you want to weigh in on this one or have any questions on? Oh, uh, it's a very wonderful conversations we've been having, and uh, and uh, I'm really. Uh, very humble to always uh, be invited to these meetings to uh, learn from everyone. I've been doing a little um, reading and digging around uh, data sovereignty and data governance and data stewardship, especially around the North. And I was wondering if uh, we could speak, well, not in this meeting, maybe another meeting, because I emailed uh, Chris to discuss this with him over offline so I can learn his thoughts. And I was going to bring it in the meeting after I learned, after I spoke with him. Because I think um, the way uh, data is governed in, in, the, in the province, especially for the North, is is harmful and, and, and it's making it difficult, more of a challenge for uh, indigenous communities to be able to use their data to their own benefits and and it's just my own personal investigation I might be wrong but that is I spoke with Dr. Malcolm King about this I don't know if if you know him uh, because he is uh he's the president of Skipper I don't know if he's the president has the right title but um I wanted to to see that you know there is something going in that in that effect. And David and I, uh, Dr. Poon and I, were trying to meet with Nita to discuss more about how the data governance and sovereignty structure is in in the province. Uh, and I know there's some politics around it, especially with SAK being custodians of a lot of the data. This is one of being this is one of the huge challenges for Simpson for us in Saskatoon and as well as with NMS. And um, I've brought this up in our meetings with uh, Simpson National, David Barber, and uh, a lot of uh, the community there. Uh, they have an indigenous um, they have an indigenous um, committee that is made up of no indigenous person, which I found very disturbing. You can be writing about data governance and data sovereignty, and no one there is First Nation, Métis, or anything, and it's all, and you're speaking for the community. So I I found that to be a first red flag, and and I told them I wasn't going to be involved until they 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 get it right. And so that is something I thought we could talk more about in future meetings, not now, and also going back to what we talked about last weekend. Um. I'm happy to volunteer my time to go over your notes from past meetings and go over your notes from previous meetings to put together something that will be community driven, community beneficial. And, and I, I think these stories 
need to go beyond our meeting outside because uh, a lot of things um, that we felt change would be our voices. And, and I think we have that already in this solid structure that we have in this meeting. So it's just putting it out there. Whenever you have the time, if you want to meet with me privately, I'll be happy to respectfully go over the notes and pick out what we could use to inform strategies to uh, to to uh, move this forward in the, in the right. I have a whole shelf full of notes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, can, I can travel over after the election and pick it up. If, if it, it would take forever to photocopy. <laughs> I can I can just take what I need. I have cameras. I can take pictures. Yeah, you can take it a lot of pictures. Uh, uh, one. This is something that actually came up in one of my conversations. Um, this past week is like, you know, I've mentioned to our health director and, and some of our people that are running in the political election that we have this opportunity in the research capacity to do this. And they wanted to know about who's going to own and access that data, mm -hmm. you know, and because uh, that's important. I, it's like, that was something I was also harping at with Nisa because data is not being collected. Well, why don't you collect it then? You know, yeah. with the COVID stuff, because I don't trust the province not, I don't yeah. trust the province to collect it. And unfortunately, I don't think Nisa is collecting it either. You know, um, they don't either lack the capacity or, you know, uh, funding, probably. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, I think, yeah, from my findings, I think it's more of funding and the capacity. And so uh, SHA holds most of the custodianship to the data because they have the structures, they have the funding. But ideally that is wrong because OCAP principle stipulates that indigenous communities should assert their rights to self-governance and self-determination with regards to data sovereignty. And, and most times they are Sty the voices are stifled because they have the power. I'm speaking of SHA, and 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 they are told that oh, we'll keep your data for you, and they're not being good data stewards with their data because most of what is put out there is deficit, uh, and it's not driven by the community. It's not properly handled, and it doesn't benefit the community. It's more about how they can get more funds for themselves, um, and so I I, I think. There needs to be more conversations around, and this is what I'm hoping we can achieve with our meeting with Nitha, because they are the voices for the North, and they could be co-data custodians with SHA in a way that um, SHA doesn't use the data without Nitha's approval. I don't know if that's something that could be achieved, but it's just theoretical in my head based on what I've been studying and, and stuff. But um, there's a lot to be discussed about it. And I think it's a conversation that that goes beyond just the four of us. We, it should involve every community and every leadership um, tier in, 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 in the province because, um, and that was what Malcolm King said, because that is something that it's long um, overdue. We are moving to uh, an era of open science and, everyone having access to data. Um, and there's a lot of abuse of data because um, a lot of indigenous communities are not asserting their rights to data governance and ownership. That's just my reflection on that. Great. So if I may, I'll okay. just add in there, Udoka, because you know, to be honest, a lot of the data a lot of the data that's in the SHA for the Northwest comes from Northern Medical Services. We we had our own charts. But because the government was funding the EMR and they were insistent it was the SHA, um, that's how it came about to be. Now, MLTC has had their own EMR for years, but unfortunately, it was never used in the same way. So there's been, even prior to the EMR, there were duplicate charts. So if our doctors went out to, say, English River, they would do a carbon copy and one copy would go to the band and or to the nursing station, one would be on our charts, which in and of itself is not appropriate either. I mean, they needed to do that, so they always had the information, but that means two charts, which mean, means it's difficult for the patient. But when we did agree and we signed agreements and stuff, it was supposed to be that any one of us would have a veto. 
with that data. So if there was any use of that data, it was supposed to come to all three so that we could all like the bands, the us and the SHA. So that if there was some misuse that we could veto that, that is not happening. They're not following through with any of their data agreements whatsoever. I would be a little careful. I'll caution you a little bit about Malcolm. I think for the most part, he's okay. Like he's got stuff, but he comes from Ontario. He lives in Ontario. He's got a title, but he will put his name to everything and he will abscond with everything. So be careful. That's all I'm going to say. But, um, you know, like I said, we do that. The I, the person, I know you've talked with him is Charles Bighead. Charles worked on this as well, but we have a lot. We actually hired a consultant to work with all three uh, groups like English River, like MLTC actually, and um, uh, SHA and Northern Medical Services. So we've got a lot of data that we tried to get everything going. And at the end, what happened was SHA then took over. And I know they're still having uh, talks. So I don't know if the community knows about this even, but there was a report that came out and it did recognize it would be better if there was one instance for the EMR but I don't know that they know much about the data. So it's something I would caution the community about because when things go with the SHA, they just do their own thing. And this idea of one template is part of the problem. So they, even though they might have those conversations, once they get on, once people get onto that EMR with the SHA, it's gone. And I don't think that people recognize, like even the data that's there right now, like if you go fill a prescription or if you get a lab test done, and it's done in a provincial site, it will it'll all be on the e-health. So even though you don't think you've got your data on those things, there's a lot of data they're collecting already that people won't realize for sure. Yeah. So data is a big one for sure. And you're, you're right, OCAP, um, you know, all, all of those self-governing principles, they have been thrown out the window when it comes to the data part of things for sure. How do you, how is there, a way like I mean I could warn them like this but I think it needs to be more official than me well I'm just wondering I'm just trying to think I I wonder if there's something like from a first nations perspective I almost think something like I think both Métis Nation Saskatchewan and FSIN should be yeah. calling this out these are governance issues and mm -hmm. I think that probably would have the most power. The unfortunate part is at the university level, like for instance, I know with Métis Nation, they've kind of got it now where they don't want anything about Métis without it going through their, like, uh, oh, who is it now? Boyer, um, Kurt Boyer, I think is their kind of guy on the ground. But that's really not the way it should be. It should really be through the communities themselves, I believe is the way it should be. So anyways, like, but with FSIN, I mean, they have a way too that they want to make sure that there is community governance of what's going on. So I think either the communities come together because I think the larger your voice can be, the better. But I would think that those governance, because those are governing organizations, they should be advocating on behalf of the communities for things like data sovereigns. And they know it. I mean, they know the stuff inside out. They've got the lawyers, they've got all the resources to do that. So I would think they should be able to do it. Just to clarify, uh, you've used a couple of acronyms, I guess, OCAP and oh, also yeah. EMR. What what are those? Sorry, EMR is the electronic medical records. So in the province, SHA, well, the province has what they call eHealth Saskatchewan, and they are sort of the IT people, the um, information technology people. And a lot of those decisions and data is gathered through that uh, mechanism. And then EMR, they have the SHA have people that work within the SHA for EMR people and electronic medical records. But, you know, in the Northwest, they don't even have anybody. They have one guy that sort of helps with on the ground stuff, but they don't have somebody really physically in the communities to help even train people, make sure they're on it all comes out of the former Prairie North. So again, it's a sign of how little there is and how difficult it is to really make good use of that, that data in, in a lot of ways. Uh, over on the Northeast side out of La Ronge, for instance, 
our clinic manager used to be able to pull data and information out of the charts when they wanted, like how many people we had who are diabetics or how many, you know, we should be able to do that. That would make good sense. We don't have any comparability for something like that on the, on the Northwest side. In fact, in some of our places, I don't even know that we have everybody within that system. So it's a real hodgepodge and there's not really anybody helping or directing or anything like that at all. Um, OCAP is, uh, they call it OCAP principles. I'll have to look up what it actually stands for again here, but it's a basic tenant around basically nothing for us without us. And um, it's for ownership, control, access, and position, possession is what it stands for. So it's, the, it's, you know, the basic idea that First Nations have control over their own data. That's, and it came under this, um, uh, they call it OCAP principles and that any data collection processes that they own and control how the information is to be used. So this has already been established. It's not like it's something you have to establish, but it just means that we haven't been following that. And here in Saskatchewan, this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Our current government and the SHA don't seem to be aware of any of these things. So they're just reinventing their own wheel in the way they see fit but this is not appropriate. There has been things that have been established. I don't think they really understand what treaty rights even mean. Like, <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> they don't want to understand either. Well, I know, but I mean, this is like, it's just, uh, like I said, it's just, it's a real mess. And I've never seen anything like it anywhere else, to be honest. So, I mean, I'm sure there are other places, but it, it just, doesn't seem like they have any idea, but in a province where we have as many First Nations as we do, where we have the kind of um, established communities where we do, this shouldn't even be a question, but it's it's really, and we are different than, we're an outlier compared to most other places. So it, it is interesting in that way, but yeah. What would what was the P for, you know, Kat? Possession. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I looked at this uh, acronym. Uh, it came from an editing program I was doing the other day about former chief uh, Cadmus. Delorme. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was presenting to uh, the family gathering here at English River here a year ago. And that's what he was saying. You got to assert your sovereignty. If you're not yes, going to give it yeah. to you. It's, you know, no. and, and once you assert your sovereignty, then you just got to know the language and protocols. Then you, you got to know what you're doing. It's... Uh, so thanks, Udoka. That's you hit uh, a, a good one here. That's awesome. Thank you. It's uh, but it's naivety as well. So if our leaders don't know about it, and exactly. um, yeah. Chief Cadmus was saying, if you don't know what to say or what to do, uh, gonna take advantage of you. It's not yeah. yours. You know, <laughs> you yeah. got exactly. you to assert your right and uh, yeah. and uh, well, maybe this conversation will. We'll brighten up a few of our it's making me really nervous. And that was the latest update on issues affecting Northern Saskatchewan, especially the health and the multi-jurisdictions between the province and the federal jurisdictions and the challenges we're facing with public health and infrastructure challenges of Northern Saskatchewan. This is Rick the Liberty reporting from Treaty 10 News with CIPI TV.